Welcome to this month's Third Thursday webinar, brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. The Third Thursday webinar is part of an ongoing free monthly webinar series. Each presentation is done by a Synergy subject matter expert who will tackle difficult issues that arise at settlement. During today's presentation, if you have questions, type them into the control panel where it says questions. The following brief presentation will give you an overview of what Synergy does in 30 seconds. A uh, trial lawyer's job isn't to know all the nuances, to know what it takes to keep Medicaid in place or SSI and preserve Medicare and comply with the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and resolve these complicated liens that may be present. So all of those issues are issues that the trial lawyer really doesn't have the time or the expertise to deal with. They need a partner that they can rely upon that can handle all of those issues and that's, that's exactly what Synergy is. Welcome to Synergy Settlement Services third Thursday webinar. My name is Jason Lazarus, Chief Executive Officer for Synergy Settlement Services. And today I'm going to be talking to you about compliance strategies for closing cases in 2020 and beyond. I've got a lot to cover today, but I wanted to give you a brief overview of the topics that we're going to hit. It's really all the difficult issues that a trial lawyer faces when settling a catastrophic claim from government benefits to planning to needs-based public benefits, the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, ERISA liens, FEBA and military liens, and qualified settlement funds. The first topic I'm going to address is giving advice to clients about their options at settlement. There's a variety of different ethical issues and malpractice concerns that can arise for failure to advise a client, so I wanted to address those. There are several laws that impact settlement that you should be aware of and the client should have explained to them depending on their situation. The first is the section of the U.S. Code that provides for trusts that allow assets or a settlement to be placed into that are not countable for purposes of qualifying for public assistance eligibility. That's 42 U.S.C. 1396 PD4. The next is the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, and that obviously is applicable for those that are on uh, Medicare benefits or those who have applied for Social Security disability and may be on Medicare benefits in the future. Uh, next up is uh, Section 104A2 of the Internal Revenue Code, which is the provision that excludes from gross income personal physical injury recoveries and basically sets up um, a decision for clients. They've got two options. One is just simply receive the settlement in a lump sum or second, set up future periodic payments using a structured settlement. The last one is constructive receipt. That's a pretty important tax doctrine, um, which can easily easily be triggered accidentally by taking monies into your trust account. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a little more detail later on in the presentation, but it is something to keep in mind and make sure that you're aware of the implications when you do trigger constructive receipt for an injury victim. The critical question when it comes to all these issues is what are the obligations to advise a client? And you know, first off, the, the question is, what are your obligations to advise the client related to public assistance eligibility and preservation of that? You know, how does the impact, uh, how, how is the settlement impacted by receipt of public benefits? Um, what are the techniques to protect eligibility? All of those issues are very important for catastrophic injury cases if you're not getting enough dollars to completely fund future care, because for most clients, they're going to need that government assistance as either a backstop or even primary. So planning to protect that eligibility is really important. And if you fail to advise the client on those issues, there can be a very negative impact on the client. Uh, the, the next question is, is, do you have an obligation to advise the client regarding their financial options at settlement? Uh, you know, most trial lawyers focus, rightfully so, on the dollar value of the case and getting the best financial uh, recovery for the client, which is incredibly important. But if there is a focus on just the dollar value and these issues are not addressed, 
uh, it can have a devastating uh, effect on the client's financial situation and uh, future uh, for their recovery. And ultimately, the, the mismanagement of the recovery and loss of public benefits becomes likely if these issues are not addressed by you as the lawyer, uh, excuse me, you as the client's trusted advisor. So also the issue arises, uh, you know, what are your malpractice risks here? Uh, because if you fail to advise the client, then perhaps there's, um, uh, you're falling below the standard of care. If you look at the ABA model rules, clearly you've got an obligation to explain matters to the client so that they can make informed decision. Um, and you've got to abide by the client's decisions and consult with the client as to the means by which objectives are to be pursued and whether to settle. And so all those two rules together are important rules when it comes to the question of failing to give advice and whether that creates a malpractice risk. Uh, there, there was a pretty comprehensive study in 2003 done by the ABA. And in that study, um, personal injury lawyers made up the largest percentage of malpractice claims. Uh, advice and settlement negotiation made up over 23% of the claims overall. So when you combine those two categories, they're tied for first in terms of the highest claims by type of activity in the study, which is an important point in terms of professional uh, responsibility and malpractice issues. The Grillo case is probably the most widely cited case as it relates to malpractice liability for failing to do the type of planning and provide the necessary advice for a personal injury client. This case dates back to 2001, stemmed from a medical malpractice claim from a birth injury. It was a pretty catastrophic injury at birth. Um, after the legal mal, uh, excuse me, after the medical malpractice case was settled, there was a subsequent legal malpractice claim against the personal injury firm that had handled it because what they did was they put the money into a Section 142 trust in Texas um, and purchased taxable annuities, which basically meant that the child could never qualify for government assistance and also uh, couldn't avail themselves of the tax-free benefits of a, a structured settlement. So the the ma main allegations against the attorneys were failing to set up a special needs trust to preserve the Medicaid benefits, which I think is a pretty much a no-brainer claim. The other claim was was talking about their triggering constructive receipt, which I had mentioned previously, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more detail later on, um, but also failing to advise the client about structured settlements and the benefits of it and what that would have meant for the injury victim, the minor injury victim. And so the, the question becomes, if you're not providing this type of counsel and advice, either yourself or through experts, how do you defend against those types of allegations? It becomes almost impossible. Uh, this case settled uh, for 1.6 million against the plaintiff attorneys, uh, and interestingly, two and a half million dollars against the guardian ad litem. So if you're acting as a guardian ad litem in a case, you wanna be careful to make sure that this type of planning is, is addressed because there's clearly malpractice liability for failing to do so. So in a malpractice case uh, where it's alleged that uh, the proper settlement planning wasn't done, there's definitely quantifiable damages. If someone's lost their public assistance eligibility, the value of that is, is easy to quantify. Um, in, in certain states, the settlement proceeds can be protected under certain state protection statutes, for, for example, for annuities. Um, so failing to do a structured settlement, you could expose the settlement proceeds to potential um, recovery in a debtor situation. The tax breaks that you get with structured settlements also is, is potentially a, a damage. Um, so there's, there's, there's clearly quantifiable damages. And the question, you know, what does this all mean? In my opinion, what it what it really means is that you as the trial lawyer have to explain the impact of settlement uh, uh, to this particular client that you're representing because if you fail to do so, there's no way that they can make an informed decision and potentially they lose the opportunity to exercise 
different options available to them under the law and then consequently damages flow from that. And I read Grillo's message as to make sure that you're employing or consulting with competent experts in taxation, trusts, government benefits, and structured settlements prior to settlement to make sure that your client has all of the options. Because if you don't address these issues with the client, there's no one else that will. They're legal issues and they're issues that uh, as trial counsel, you have an obligation to make sure that the client gets the answers they need. And there really is no particular threshold, but keep in mind that if they're on needs-based government assistance, uh, it could be a settlement of $10,000 or less that could impair their ability to receive government benefits. So you really have to be mindful of this, regardless of the size of settlement, if you're dealing with someone that's catastrophically injured and disabled. Because of everything I just talked about, I wanted to go through a very quick overview of government benefits because this is a fertile area for potential malpractice claims failing to make sure that that client has their government assistance programs protected can be catastrophic for the client. So this chart gives you an overview of the different government benefit programs. The top portion of it are the needs-based uh, and income and asset sensitive programs. That's SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, and Medicaid, both um, disability and child, uh, which can be family related and non-disability um, if that child is not disabled. And then the entitlements, which are Social Security, Disability, and Medicare. One thing that's important to note, well, actually two things. One is there's two different Social Security benefits. One is needs-based, one is not. Um, and with Social Security, there is a tie-in between SSI and Medicaid in most states, and there is uh, a tie-in between SSDI when you become disabled and getting Medicare prior to retirement age. So keep that in mind. I'll also make sure um, you, you are identifying these as potential areas where you have a lean situation, Medicaid, uh, you're going to have uh, a lien, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in more detail later on in the presentation. Same with Medicare, you're going to have conditional payments or possibly Medicare Advantage liens, which have to be resolved. Social Security does not have any liens against a settlement, so there's no issue to worry about in that regard. When you're dealing with somebody that's uh, catastrophically injured and disabled, uh, the question becomes, why is it so important to make sure you do planning? The primary reason is preserving those, those government benefits because those can provide a lifetime of financial support and medical care for that client. Um, you know, making sure that ultimately a plan is devised creates a system of advocacy to preserve the rights and the care, the level of care for that client. Um, and doing this type of planning can create a knowledgeable and long-term management team for that particular client to, to make sure that the recovery is properly managed and they keep their government benefits intact. Not every client who is disabled is going to require special type of planning, although a lot of them will. Really what you have to be on the lookout for are clients who are so severely disabled that they meet the definition of disability for government benefit programs and that they are receiving government benefits that require some type of planning. So the different categories are those that are on SSI and Medicaid since they're needs-based. Anyone that's on Medicare due to the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that later on in the presentation, or those that get both Medicaid and Medicare. We, we call those dual eligibles. And those folks, they, they basically have all of their uh, medical, uh, covered between Medicaid and Medicare, there's there's virtually no out of pocket for those that are dual eligible because Medicaid supplements what Medicare does not pay for. In that instance, Medicare is primary over Medicaid. Next up is a discussion about the needs-based government benefits and the planning associated with them. So as I said during the, the discussion that I just engaged in about the overview of government benefits and why planning is so important. Um, th these are the needs-based benefits, which are Medicaid and SSI, and if planning is not done, can easily be lost by even a very small recovery. 
So SSI or Supplemental Security Income is cash assistance for those that are 65 or older, blind or disabled. The current maximums are $783 a month if you're single, $1175 per month if you're married. There's no requirement for having worked a certain amount of quarters, um, as would be the case with SSDI. So typically those getting SSI are people that have not worked enough quarters. And it does have an asset cap. Um, so if you have more than $2,000 in uh, assets, if you're single or 3,000 if you're married, you cannot be eligible for SSI. And this is why it becomes really important even in small settlements. If someone's on SSI, if you give them $2,000, uh, if they have more assets, if they have you know money in the bank, you've just disqualified them. Uh, there's also an income cap associated with the SSI program. So basically, you have to be indigent. In most states, $1 of SSI automatically gives you Medicaid coverage, which is the basic health care coverage for those that are indigent. If you represent a client who's on Medicaid and SSI and is disabled, that's when special planning needs to be considered and establishing a special needs trust may be the right uh, solution for that settlement. Because uh, if you give money to an injury victim and they are on SSI and Medicaid, you're going to eliminate their eligibility because in the month they get that money, it's income, so it counts against the income cap. And if they've not spent it down by the next uh, calendar month, then it's counted as, a, as an available resource. So if you're over the $2,000, if you're single or 3,000 total asset cap, then they're gonna be ineligible. And for a lot of clients, they, they don't care about losing their SSI because as I outlined, the SSI maximum payments are very small, but that will trigger a loss of Medicaid in most instances because of that connection. And that can be devastating if the client doesn't understand that and that's not their desire. So typically you want to keep that SSI intact to make sure that that client continues with their Medicaid coverage. When settling a case for an injury victim, there's different types of trusts that should be considered to uh, be established for a personal injury settlement. The first is what I call a standalone special needs trust or a D4A trust. Those are created for anyone that's disabled and they've got to be disabled under the social security definition, uh, even though they don't have to have a formal uh, decision that they're disabled. Um, and they have to be under the age of 65 to set up a standalone special needs trust. The next type of trust is a pool trust or a D4C trust. Those can be created for anyone that's disabled regardless of age. They still have to meet that social security definition of disability, but there's no age cap like there is on the D4A standalone. And then the last one is a third party special needs trust. These are used uh, not all that frequently, but there's a couple of situations that can arise where they might be applicable. One would be a GoFundMe where the community does a fundraiser. Those assets, because they're not the clients, they're not a first party situation, which is what the D4A and D4C trusts are for. Instead, you set up a third party trust. Similarly, if you had a minor child who was disabled due to an injury, and mom and dad ultimately wanted to give them assets upon their death, you'd set up a third party special needs trust. Because again, third party special needs trusts are for assets that not, are not the injury victim's own assets. So the advantages of setting up a special needs trust is it keeps the government assistance programs um, in place if they're needs based, because the amount of money that goes into that trust is not countable under federal law. Uh, most of these trusts, and Typically, I advise the client to do this, to retain a professional trustee who understands the complicated rules for Social Security and Medicaid eligibility. Um, in a lot of states, oftentimes having a special needs trust for someone that's a minor or incompetent will avoid the need for a guardianship and annual reporting. And then these trusts can pay for everything except food or shelter. They're sole benefit trusts, so they can only pay for things that the injury victim themselves needs, but in most situations, that's, that's what's needed. Um, so the disadvantages is the client doesn't have unrestricted use of the money. Uh, these trusts have specific rules and, and those rules follow the 
rules for eligibility for these government assistance programs. As I said, sole benefit rule, trust can only be used for the sole benefit of the trust beneficiary. At death, Medicaid must be paid back uh, for care that they've provided, and it varies by state law um, what the duration of that is. For example, in my home state of Florida, it goes from the date the trust is created until date of death. The, uh, the only exception to that is third-party special needs trusts. When you set up this type of trust, it does create an extra layer of complexity, um, and these trusts are irrevocable, meaning they can't be undone. Two final issues to be aware of, um, deeming. Deeming is, um, is applicable when you've got a um, parent and minor child or spouses. And what deeming means is, um, say you've got a parent and minor child, um, mom and dad have consortium claims, um, minor child is disabled, minor's recovery is put into a special needs trust, but mom and dad get $100,000 for their consortium claim. That 100000 is deemed to the minor child, and you have just disqualified that family from getting Medicaid because mom and dad have that hundred grand, and the child has that hundred grand, even though their recovery, which could be millions of dollars, is protected in s &T. Only applies, though, between parent and minor child, not parent and adult child, but it, it does apply in spousal situations. So you got to be careful with consortium claims. Lastly, exempt assets. If you have a situation where client is receiving a smaller net and they want to buy a house or a car, those are typically exempt assets um, and won't disqualify the client. And they can simply spend down the money and purchase those exempt assets without setting up these types of trusts. But you've really got to, you've got to investigate that option and figure out if it's appropriate. And that's where consulting with an elder law attorney, um, which is something that I do here in Florida. Um, I've got a separate law firm where I work with clients. So these are issues I deal with consistently. And you've got to be aware of these issues and make sure the client understands them and have the right consultant working with you to identify these issues. Before moving away from special needs trusts, I wanted to mention pooled trusts, which is something I just mentioned um, uh, on the previous slide. Pooled trusts are established by a not-for-profit, and typically these pooled trusts are different from standalone special needs trusts in that they don't have a minimum uh, deposit, there's no age restriction, um, there's an already established master trust that the trust beneficiary joins, and they join it by signing a, a very um, basic joinder, so you don't have to go through all the drafting requirements of a standalone. And the advantages of using a pooled trust is that it is managed by a not-for-profit, so low annual fees, and uh, they will typically accept small trusts and large trusts because oftentimes, in many cases, the pooled trust is a great option even for a larger recovery. So in terms of evaluating the pool trust solutions, because there's many of them out there, and most of them were created for nursing home situations where somebody's trying to qualify for Medicaid coverage for nursing home care, you want to make sure that for an injury victim, you've got a not-for-profit trustee that understands personal injury settlements. You want to look at the types of services that are available to the trust beneficiary. Uh, for example, the pool trust that I was um, helped uh, to create is got services that are offered by TrueLink, which is a financial services company that's pretty unique that gives clients a credit card that they can use for monthly expenditures, which is a big advantage over the way many trusts operate in terms of how to access funds. One, another one is Team, which is allows uh, family members or others to be employed by the trust and provides workers' comp coverage and does payroll and basically makes it turnkey to employ people to provide services to the injury victim. And lastly, most importantly, a lot of full trusts have um, a retained funds policy, meaning at death they will retain some of them 100%, some of them 50% uh, of the money at death. So you want to make sure that you're dealing with one that's got a low uh, percentage. For example, the one I was involved with, only retains 10% or $10,000, whichever is less, and, and that's just retained for charitable purposes. But some of these trusts do retain a large amount of the assets. One option that 
is, is possible instead of creating a special needs trust are ABLE accounts. And these were created by the ABLE Act. Um, the, the problem with these is, is the limitations on who can create them and the amounts that can go in. So this can only be created for someone that was disabled prior to age 26. You can contribute a maximum of $15,000 yearly, and there can be no more than 100,000 total um, in that account if the client is on SSI. The nice part about this is that it can pay for food or shelter even if the client's on SSI, which is something special needs trusts can't. These do have the Medicaid payback requirement. And oftentimes what happens is these things get funded out of a special needs trust. So you can have a special needs trust and an ABLE account simultaneously because the ABLE does let you pay for things that the special needs trust won't allow for. And a structured settlement can be used to, to fund an ABLE account so you get that minimum amount in um, or the maximum amount in on an annual basis. So there's there's some, some situations where the ABLE account makes a lot of sense. It's just one other uh, possible solution in the toolkit for planning for someone that's on government assistance. So we've covered the government assistance programs and the planning associated with it. Uh, quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about Medicaid liens and reducing those pursuant to Allborn. As most trial lawyers know, the Allborn case was the seminal case for Medicaid liens and limited the Medicaid agency's ability to recover in circumstances where you have a large amount of damages, but a limited recovery. And basically the Allborn decision set up kind of a default formula, even though it's not required of looking at the total value of the case as compared to uh, what was actually recovered to create a ratio to limit the amount of a Medicaid lien to the past medical expenses. The Allborn case was affirmed uh, in 2013 by the WAS case and WAS involved North Carolina's Medicaid third-party liability recovery statute, and their statute required up to one-third of any damages uh, being paid to Medicaid to reimburse for third-party uh, liens. And in this particular case, the uh, court found that that statute wasn't compatible with the federal anti-lien provisions and violated the holding of Allborn, uh, which precludes attachment or encumbrance of any portion of a settlement not designated as payments for medical care. So the Allborn and Wass cases are the underpinnings of making the arguments uh, for a lesser amount being due to Medicaid. And because Medicaid is, is um, administered at the state level, the third party liability statutes vary all across the country and you know, for example, in Florida, we have a administrative uh, law process that must be followed to get an Allborn reduction where you basically have to have a hearing and make arguments uh, to an administrative law judge as to why that Medicaid lien should be reduced pursuant to Allborn. But not all states have that. Many states um, have, uh, you know, the, the ability to just simply negotiate it depends, you know, some states like Florida, for, for example, and this is why we have this whole administrative process, there's a third party recovery vendor that Medicaid uses called Conduit, who is pretty aggressive about their recovery efforts on behalf of Medicaid. So the ability to reduce Medicaid liens is based on these, these federal cases, but, you know, ultimately it's going to boil down to what the process is and, and how open the agency is to negotiation and resolution. Now that I've addressed the needs-based government benefit programs of Medicaid and SSI, I want to turn to Medicare and Social Security Disability and give you an overview of those programs and then turn to a, a more lengthy discussion about the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and the responsibilities. So as I said previously, SSDI and Medicare are not income or asset sensitive, their entitlements, they're funded out of our payroll taxes that we pay in. And if somebody has enough quarters paid into the system and becomes disabled, they get social security disability. Um, and then they get Medicare 30 months after disability. There's a six month elimination period 
uh, before they get their first disability check, then 24 months thereafter, they become a Medicare beneficiary. Medicare coverage has multiple parts. So part A and part B is your typical health insurance. Part D is your prescription drugs. Part C is Medicare Advantage plans, which typically will roll parts A, parts B, and parts D into one plan that's administered by a private company that's approved by Medicare. And those are, those are uh, becoming increasingly important. I'm gonna dedicate some time to talking about the issues that can arise with these Medicare Advantage plans. But just keep in mind that there are these different types of options available to the injury victim and they could be on part a and part b initially and then switch over to a medicare advantage plan when open enrollment happens so you've got to make sure you really understand these different coverages and know what that client is receiving because the planning uh, that's required becomes uh, dependent upon which coverage they're receiving benefits under so since we're talking about medicare beneficiaries the discussion would not be complete without getting into the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and its obligations because this is an area that's uh, fertile for potential um, exposure and malpractice risk for trial attorneys. The Medicare Secondary Payer Act is a pretty large and complex piece of legislation, but it basically says that Medicare is always supposed to be the secondary payer to all forms of insurance, including workers' comp, liability, and no-fault insurance. According to Medicare, there are two obligations under the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. The first runs from the date of the settlement backwards. Those are conditional payments made by Medicare prior to the date of settlement. And then those obligations that arise from the date of the settlement going forward, which are futures, which is the Medicare set aside issue. And this all becomes very important and relevant because of Section 111 mandatory insurer reporting. Uh, that requirement now requires insurers to report any settlement of $750 or more uh, if it involves a Medicare beneficiary. So the government gets a, uh, a a report of any settlement under this reporting requirement. So it can trigger both final demands that you don't expect and potential denials of care for future. So I'm gonna get into that in a moment. I wanna spend a little bit of time on Medicare conditional payments and the importance for law firms to have an MSP compliance program. The reason that this discussion uh, is really important is because starting in 2018, the Department of Justice began pursuing law firms for failing to reimburse for Medicare conditional payments. And this was the first um, press release involving a uh, law firm out of Philadelphia that agreed to pay $28,000 to Medicare for failing to reimburse uh, Medicare conditional payments at settlement. And what's important about this is what the government's saying here is the settlement agreement should remind personal injury lawyers of their obligation to reimburse Medicare for conditional payments after receiving settlement monies. And going on to say that when the attorney fails to reimburse Medicare, the U United States can recover from the attorney even if the attorney already transmitted the proceeds to the client. So getting the money directly from the lawyer because that's what the regulations allows. So it's talking about holding trial lawyers accountable for failing to make good on their obligations when it comes to the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. And you don't wanna wind up in a situation where the DOJ is coming after your law firm. This press release is particularly important from March of 2019 involving a Maryland law firm, Myers, Robdell, and Rosenbaum, which agreed to pay the government $250,000 to resolve outstanding Medicare conditional payment uh, issues. And I wanted to talk about the facts of this one because it's really important for law firms to understand the process and, and how things work to make sure that you don't fall into the trap that this particular law firm fell into. This particular case involved a medical malpractice action that involved a Medicare beneficiary. So the law firm properly notified Medicare of the personal injury case. The um, 
Medicare issued a conditional payment letter indicating that 14,990 had been paid thus far for the Medicare beneficiary. The personal injury law firm relied upon that conditional payment letter amount to settle the case. So subsequently, um, when the case was settled, CMS was notified of the settlement and then a final demand was issued for $330,000. The law firm did an administrative appeal during which interest was accruing, which was ultimately denied. And then the case was referred over to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which sent a letter demanding payment. And ultimately, the law firm turned the matter over to their E&O carrier, who paid a reduced amount. Myers Robdell uh, issued a public response to the uh, press release that I just uh, described and in that they talked a lot about the fact that uh, you know Medicare should have known that the 14,990 amount was a, a very low amount um, because of the fact that there had been quite a bit of care the the problem with all of this is that the law firm relied upon a conditional payment letter which does not bind Medicare and that's the really important takeaway from this is that the only thing that binds Medicare is that final demand the conditional payment letters are for purposes of doing audit verification if you know that the amount is low and you know that that clients had a lot of care that Medicare is paid for then Medicare is probably going to pick it all up when when you go to request a final demand so you cannot rely on that conditional payment letter or it could be a situation where the client moved over to a medicare advantage plan and then you got to start dealing with those issues i'm going to talk about that momentarily but really the critical thing here is to understand that that conditional payment letter is not binding on medicare now once they issue the final demand now had they issued the final demand for 14,990 and not picked up that additional care, then Medicare would have been bound by that and this law firm would have had no problem. But relying on that conditional payment letter uh, was a mistake and the law firm ultimately paid for that mistake. And you want to make sure that you don't ever fall into that uh, potential uh, hole. And on top of it, they compounded the mistake by trying to appeal. And there really was a, a variety of mistakes here, regardless of what the law firm said in their public response. Ultimately, there were mistakes made here which led to uh, their, their situation because they just simply couldn't rely on that conditional payment letter. This next press release from November of 2019 is, is quite important, in my opinion, for law firms to, to understand the implications as well. So this was a $90,000 settlement. But here what happened was there was um, uh, a law firm that had referred cases to another law firm that law firm the one that had accepted the referral of the cases did not resolve the medicare conditional payments and what happened was the doj went after the original law firm who referred the cases because there simply is no escape from these issues just because you refer a case out to another law firm so you know the takeaway from this is when you're referring a case to another law firm, you want to make sure you have three things, a fee agreement, like you, you guys know, a lawyer copy of the lawyer's malpractice insurance to make sure that they've got proper coverage, but then proof that the lawyer has in, engaged either a third party like Synergy to resolve the Medicare conditional payments or has a program in place. Because as you'll see here from the quotes, uh, the U.S. government says that plaintiff attorneys can't refer a case um, and simply wash their hands of their obligations to reimburse Medicare for its conditional payments. And it's no less true for plaintiff attorneys who refer cases to co-counsel or jointly represent plaintiffs. So it reminds attorneys of their obligation to reimburse Medicare regardless of the situation. This is a uh, 2020 DOJ press release. And it, as you can see, the DOJ is going after law firms for even a relatively small amount of money. Um, what I wanted to point out here was what 
the law firm agreed to, which um, was part of the resolution. And most of these have um, involved this type of an agreement, but basically naming a person responsible for paying Medicare secondary payer debts within the firm, training that employee to make sure that they pay debts on a timely basis, basically doing a compliance program for Medicare um, that is agreed upon based on the DOJ taking action. Um, and what's in red at the bottom of the slide, um, lawyers need to set a good example and follow the rules of the road for Medicare reimbursement. If they don't, we will move aggressively to recover the money for taxpayers. So the government is sending some pretty clear messages here when it comes to Medicare compliance. And what you don't ever want to do is have the DOJ coming in and mandating uh, a Medicare compliance program for your law firm. And most recently, this was last month, uh, August of 2020, another law firm that was being uh, pursued by the DOJ for failing to reimburse Medicare, this time uh, 50 some odd thousand dollars being agreed to be paid. Um, you know, the, the, the crux of all this is, is that you just don't wanna wind up in a scenario where the DOJ is coming in and looking at your law firm's um, Medicare conditional payment reimbursement program because if you make mistakes, then you have liability and it's personal liability for the lawyer and for the law firm. So I've been talking about some mistakes and liability. I want to go through quickly the process to resolve personal injury uh, Medicare conditional payment scenarios because it's important to make sure that you've got the basics. When you are representing a Medicare beneficiary, the first step is reporting the potential case to the BCRC. The BCRC will issue that rights and responsibilities letter. Um, they will identify Medicare's interim, and that's critical, recovery amount, and issue that conditional payment letter, which as I said, does not bind Medicare. At that point, you wanna dispute any unrelated charges, do your audit verification. When the case settles, you gotta send notice to Medicare with the terms of settlement, and then the final demand is issued. And that's the only thing, as I said, that binds Medicare. Then interest will accrue from the date of the final demand. If it's not paid, it gets ultimately referred over to Treasury for collection after 90 days. The important thing to notice is that interest is charged when the final demand is not paid, and that, is not told if you request an appeal or a waiver compromise and interest is due and payable for each 30-day period the debt remains unresolved and by law all payments are applied to interest first principal second so once medicare does receive payment they'll send a letter stating that the lien has been reduced to zero and the case is closed and that's what you ultimately need for your file Next, I'm gonna quickly address what you need to know about resolving Medicare conditional payments, how you go about it, and the formulas applied. So basic overview of the different resolution options available. One is simply pay the amount after you've done an audit verification. Second option is to appeal. There's four levels of internal appeal within Medicare, so it's a pretty lengthy process before you even see the inside of a federal district court. All the while, if the final demand was not paid, interest will continue to accrue. The third option, which makes the most sense in many situations, is to pay the final demand and request a compromise and waiver. And if you're successful, then Medicare will actually issue a refund back of the monies that are being waived or compromised. When you're resolving Medicare conditional payments, there's two reduction formulas. Basically, it's a pro rata reduction for fees and costs. Uh, if the amount that Medicare is demanding is less than the judgment or settlement, that works great. Um, if you need to get more uh, of a reduction, then you have to go through that compromise or waiver process. If it's a situation where Medicare payments equal to or exceed the judgment or settlement, Medicare can basically take the entire amount, less fees and costs, that's a situation where most likely you have to do a compromise or waiver request. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. I wanted to bring up this case, United States v. Kerrigan, because it's really important to understand what uh, was done incorrectly here and make sure you avoid it. So 
In this particular instance, uh, the attorney represented a Medicare beneficiary related to a car accident and filed suit in Texas. Uh, the lawyer properly notified uh, Medicare about the accident. Um, the settlement details were sent to the BCRC. Um, so Medicare made an interim conditional payment uh, amount of $46,000. During that time period, um, the attorney filed a motion in state court regarding the amount due to Medicare. Subsequent to that, Medicare issues a final demand. Um, the attorney had received an order from a Texas state court reducing Medicare's conditional payment down by 90%. And then ultimately, Medicare didn't accept that and the U.S. attorney filed suit against Kerrigan and his law firm in federal district court. So the government brought the action under the Medicare Secondary Repair Act to recover monies directly from the lawyer. And the basis of the lawsuit was that the Texas state court who had issued an order reducing the Medicare conditional payment lacked jurisdiction to adjudicate Medicare's recovery rights, sovereign immunity, subject matter, jurisdiction issues. Um, the government put in their lawsuit that their position is that challenges or disputes of conditional payments must go through the administrative appeal process I described that's set out in the Medicare Secondary Repair Act and its regulations. And only after exhaustion of those remedies can a claim be made in federal court, which has exclusive subject matter jurisdiction. And then of course, the government pointed to the fact that the lawyer who has personal liability under the Medicare regs for failing to reimburse Medicare in this situation. So the key takeaway uh, from USV Kerrigan is that you've got to make sure that if you want to reduce the Medicare conditional payment, you do it the right way. Going to a state court to get a Medicare conditional payment reduced is not going to be successful. There are specific ways to challenge conditional payments. The compromise and waiver process that I mentioned is the right way to do it. And if you do it the wrong way, you're going to wind up in a situation similar to USV Kerrigan, which you don't want to ever be in that position. So doing it the right way, as I mentioned, is seeking a compromise or waiver. Um, and this involves um, making a request for a compromise or waiver or both to either BCRC and or CMS. And there's three different uh, legal authorities under which Medicare can accept less than the full amount of its claim. The first is based on financial hardship. The next one is best interest of the program. And the last one is under the FCCA, which is a compromise request. And if you are successful making arguments under any of those provisions, then Medicare will either compromise or waive the amount completely and issue a refund based on the amount that had already been paid in. Because if you're going to go down the path of doing a compromise or waiver, you really want to pay the final demand within the proper time frame so you don't trigger interest accruing while you are making the request for this compromise or waiver. This is a great example of what's possible with a Medicare refund request. This was a catastrophic case that was a large recovery, a seven-figure recovery. Uh, the client was uh, shot multiple times in a negligent security case. Just a tragic, tragic situation. Uh, she was on Medicare and Medicaid. So we made a uh, waiver request and was able to get the $159,000 Medicare conditional payment amount completely waived and refunded back to the client as it had been paid to Medicare to make sure that the interest did not accrue. So it's very possible to get a complete and full refund in these scenarios. I wanted to give you an idea of our success rate because it shows just how um, much of an opportunity there is to get these things reduced or completely waived based on making these arguments. So last year, the average success rate was over 77%, uh, over $1.2 million in refunds were secured by our lien resolution group and the average refund was over 16K. And since we started offering this service, uh, we've recovered in excess of $6.8 million. Many of uh, our competitors say that Medicare does not 
issue refunds and this is not possible but I can tell you definitively it's possible and there's legal basis for making these arguments and if you're not doing it yourself for your clients then you should be hiring a firm like Synergy to make sure that those clients are getting this money back from Medicare or getting their Medicare conditional payment reduced one final point um, hospitals do not have to bill Medicare they can choose to stand on their lien rights um, but there is a interpretation by CMS that its regs mean that after one year a lien's got to be released so in that scenario a hospital could not collect directly from the beneficiary or from the settlement um, but you have to remember that uh, ultimately, and, and this is a bit dependent on state law, a hospital, if they stand on their lien rights, are typically going to be um, only limited to a reasonable amount being due. So there are ways to reduce uh, hospital bills, uh, and that's something that Synergy also assists with. So before getting to Medicare futures, I wanted to talk a little bit about Medicare Advantage plans. I call these hidden liens because the Medicare Advantage plans or MAOs or Part C uh, are, if they have a recovery right, they're not going to be identified by Medicare. So I talked a little bit about these Medicare Advantage and Part C plans when I was talking about the different coverages under the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. But basically, these MAOs are private plans. Um, they're, they're using Medicare dollars, but they're administered by private insurance companies. The uh, recovery rights for a Medicare Advantage plan are, are the same as Medicare itself, but typically these plans are, are much more open to negotiation and resolution. Uh, the problem is, is if you miss it, uh, that's where it can be potentially be a very bad situation for your law firm, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a sec. So as I was just discussing, the Part C plans uh, or MAOs, Advantage plans, um, under the regulations have the same recovery rights. That's that 42 CFR 422.108. Um, CMS has, has said as such, and you've had some case law developing where these Advantage plans have pursued recovery of insurers and also um, law firms under the double damages provisions of the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, which are extended to these MAOs and have been successful um, in the 11th Circuit um, uh, and the 3rd Circuit. The 9th Circuit has some contrary case law, as does the 6th, so it depends on where you are, but potentially you can have a situation where you've got a, a very bad ultimate outcome for your law firm uh, if there is entitlement to double the amount of the lien under the Medicare Secondary Payer Act for failing to reimburse a Medicare Advantage plan. So as I just mentioned, the issue ultimately for failing to identify a Medicare Advantage plan lien is that these MAO plans who have become very aggressive about pursuing their recovery rights can pursue double the lien amount under the provisions of federal law and have done so successfully. Um, there, there is certainly precedent for Medicare coming directly after attorneys, and now we are starting to see uh, these Advantage plans get very aggressive and go after law firms. Uh, in one particular instance, the Humana versus Paris Blank was a law firm that was sued for double the amount of the lien. We actually assisted that law firm in trying to resolve that matter. So you've got to be really careful and cognizant of the potential for Medicare asserting a, uh, a Medicare Advantage plan and asserting a claim for double the lien amount against you directly. So the critical thing with Medicare Advantage plans is being a sleuth and making sure that you are, are examining or your staff examining all the insurance cards for a Medicare beneficiary, making sure that you've got a process and training your staff to find these potentially unidentified Medicare Advantage liens. Typically, the, the scenario is you, you ask Medicare for the conditional payment amount and they, they give you a zero or it's a very low amount. That can be a um, trigger to think, well, potentially this client opted into a Medicare Advantage plan and that's who paid for their care, not Medicare itself, which is why you're getting a zero from uh, Medicare when you 
give them information about the case. So just be aware of these issues and make sure that you are vigilant. Uh, our lien resolution group has had a lot of success reducing these Medicare Advantage plans, but you've got to make sure they're identified. Now that I've talked about payments that Medicare or Medicare Advantage plan has paid prior to the data settlement, it's now time to turn to futures. And that brings us to total Medicare secondary payer compliance, which is my terminology for dealing with uh, Medicare set-asides and the MSP issues. Because in order to really be totally Medicare compliant, you've got to have a plan for not just payments made prior to the date of settlement, but also payments made after the date of settlement, which is the MSA conundrum. Hopefully by the end of this part of the presentation, you'll have a better understanding of how to proceed and deal with these issues compliantly. This is a really important issue because if Medicare denies injury-related care, the client has to go through four levels of internal appeals before they ever get before a federal district court to challenge that denial. So a client could, in theory, go through um, over a year's worth of Medicare appeals before they were able to get care reinstated based on this uh, trigger, um, which is now the mandatory insurer reporting. So when these cases settle, the defendant has to report any settlement of $750 or greater, and they have to report the ICD codes and a bunch of other data points, which can cause your client all sorts of problems. For example, if you have a car injury case where there's allegations of a neck and back injury, but throughout litigation, the defendant takes the position that the neck is unrelated and they pay dollars just for the back, uh, then when the case settles, they report both neck and back injury diagnosis codes to Medicare. Medicare could deny care for the neck as well as the back, so that can cause some significant problems. But also, too, with this mandatory insurer reporting, it can cause issues with conditional payments because if the wrong date of accident is used, it could trigger another final demand. So an important practice point here is to really understand and make sure you know what is being reported by the other side because it can result in multiple problems in your case. The most challenging one would be a denial of care, which is remote, but it, it could happen because of all the information that gets reported now to Medicare when a case settles involving a Medicare beneficiary. So right now, Medicare set-asides are really a figment of Medicare's imagination. I, I say that because Medicare has come up with this, this concept based on their interpretation of the Act, which they are the agency in charge of interpreting the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. But for years now, we've been hearing that we're going to get some type of formal regulations in this area. The screenshot is from uh, that process, which admittedly, this is not the first time it's gone through this process, but this is the most recent iteration of it. And we were supposed to have some proposed regulations last month in August, but uh, of course they did not materialize. But basically what these regulations will do is, is codify this idea of a Medicare set aside and making sure that monies are set aside out of any personal injury settlement because Medicare is supposed to be secondary to all forms of insurance. Whether we have regulations next month, next year, I can't answer that question, but they are clearly uh, intending to have some sort of regulations at some point in the near future. And you know we're gonna have to wait to see what they say, but I don't suspect that they'll vary too much from what Medicare has said publicly about this issue, which is that people cannot shift the burden to Medicare when settling a personal injury claim if they are getting monies for future medical expenses out of the settlement. So the bottom line of it is, is that it's a gray area. And I, I could do an hour long presentation just on these issues. So this is a high level view of it all, but just remember that currently there's no regulations or statutes or cases related to Medicare set aside. So in my opinion, it's very similar to dealing with a client who's on SSI and Medicaid. 
you have the responsibility to explain the law to the client. So explaining to the client when they're on Medicaid and SSI that there's a special needs trust, um, that's a mechanism to keep their eligibility intact. Same thing with Medicare. You have to explain this issue so the client understands about Medicare set-asides and possibly setting money aside, even though most likely many clients will not want to do that. Another key point is that you only have to worry about this if you're representing a current Medicare beneficiary. So someone that's disabled, 65 or older, end-stage renal disease, ALS, or a disabled adult child. Arguably, also people with a reasonable expectation of becoming a Medicare beneficiary within 30 months. That means that they've, they've gotten on SSDI and they'll um, be Medicare eligible within 24 months because there's a six month elimination period as I described before. So that's where the total of 30 months comes from. But to realize that there are alternatives to doing an MSA without shifting the burden, the client could arguably go into Medicare Advantage plans. Medicare Advantage plans have never demanded anyone set up a set aside to my knowledge. And it would be tough for them to, to claim that they're entitled to that same uh, mechanism because it's, it's a creature of Medicare's policy. There's no regulations or statutes that extend it to Medicare Advantage plans like there is with liens. Client could also decide to be privately insured, could self-pay, could set up a medical management trust for future medical expenses or a structured settlement to help them offset and um, spend their own money on medical care. But if you have a client who's Medicare eligible, is gonna treat in the future and is getting dollars for future medical, that's when you wanna consider a Medicare set aside or some type of an alternative. And you know, Medicare's position is that an MSA is their preferred methodology to protect the Medicare trust fund. Given all of that, the question becomes, how do you be MSP compliant? And really the best advice is to start early, make sure you're compiling public benefit information for disabled clients, address the MSE, MSP process um, early on and, and control it from start to finish. You don't wanna let the defendant dictate what's going on. You don't wanna rely on their, their experts as it relates to the Medicare secondary payer compliance issues, you've got to be proactive. And when a case settles, you want to make sure that the correct data is getting reported under that mandatory insurer reporting requirement. Ultimately, you need a process for MSP compliance in your law firms. You know, this, this applies to the Medicare conditional payments, which I went through the litany of DOJ actions um, where law firms were being told they needed to create Medicare compliance programs. Really, this is all part and parcel of it, but as it relates to Medicare futures, you wanna make sure you're identifying cases that involve Medicare beneficiaries and then determining if future medicals are funded by the settlement. And if they are, educating that client on the risks of failing to set aside. And then ultimately, counseling the clients and working with experts to select the appropriate solution for making sure that these issues are addressed. So I came up with this acronym of CAD, which is consult experts, advise the client about the MSP, and then document your file. Documenting your file is just critical here because if the client were ever to experience a denial of care, you need to make sure that you've documented why nothing was set aside. If that was a client decision, then the client should sign something acknowledging that they understand the risks of doing nothing or even putting something into your closing statement saying that Medicare benefits could be jeopardized by the receipt of settlement proceeds. Now that we've hit Medicare pretty hard, I'm uh, going to focus a, a, a little bit of time on ERISA liens, you know, getting reductions despite the U.S. Supreme Court decision in McCutcheon, which made it much more difficult, is still possible. You just have to handle things in the right way and, and posture it in the right way. And that's what I'm going to talk a bit about. An important initial question is, is the plan a true ERISA plan? And ERISA governs employer-employee plans. The exceptions are if it's a federal government employee, FEBA is going to apply. If they're employed by the state, then state law is going to apply and not ERISA. And if they're employed by a church, state law is going to apply, not ERISA. So making sure first you're dealing with 
a true ERISA plan, not one of these other plans, is a threshold question. If you determine that it truly is an ERISA plan, then the next question is, is it a self-funded plan or is it insured? If it's self-funded, then ERISA is going to preempt state law and you are going to be dealing with a um, tough fight based on McCutcheon and depending on the policy language, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But if it's self-funded ERISA, it means that it's funded by contributions from the employer and employee. To contrast that, a fully insured plan would be one where it's funded by the purchase of insurance coverage. And in that scenario, uh, that plan is subject to state law. So you really got to make sure that you know whether it's self-funded or fully insured. And the way to determine that is by reviewing the plan language, the summary plan, uh, the form 5500. You can ask uh, the plan administrator or recovery agent. Also some shortcuts, if the plan is named in an employer group or titled as an ASO, it's likely self-funded. If the plan is a named insurance carrier or titled HMO or PPO, then it's likely a fully insured plan. So if you determine that you're dealing with an ERISA plan and it is self-funded, then you wanna make sure that you make a 1024B4 request. And this is just a provision in the US code that provides a list of what ERISA plan administrators must provide upon request. And that's a copy of the summary plan description, latest annual report, terminal reports, bargaining agreements, trust agreement, contract, or other instruments under which the plan is established or operated. The administrative service agreement uh, is also subject to ERISA disclosure requirements. So this is a really powerful request because the plans do not want to provide all this information. But when you make this request, you want to make it to the correct party because that's very important. The disclosure requirement is imposed upon the plan administrator. You can't send the request to a third party administrator or a recovery vendor like Rawlings, Conduit, Optum. They're never going to be the plan administrator. So you've got to make sure that you request this from the plan itself. The power of making a request like this is the leverage that it creates through penalties. So there's penalties for non-compliance. On this slide are the code sections for the penalties and then also a list of different cases where penalties were applied. So it gives you an idea of the possibility of how much can accrue in penalties which can in some instances be more than the lien amount. So using that 1024 before request is important because it gets you all the documents you need to really figure out the ERISA plan strength, but also it gives you leverage. So the plan of attack ultimately in negotiating a ERISA lien is utilizing that 1024 before request as leverage because of the penalties, but also it gives you the opportunity to review everything, make sure that the language, if you're dealing with a first party case, that it reaches first party coverage. A lot of times the language in the plan is silent or vague, uh, making sure that the language overcomes made whole. Um, in my circuit, the 11th, some very specific plan language is required for that. Um, also does the language overcome common fund because um, Oftentimes, the plans will not uh, abrogate common fund. And what the U.S. Supreme Court said in U.S. Airways v. McCutcheon is that it has to, a plan has to draft its contract to get around that. So you've got to make sure that you're reviewing the policy language to see what it addresses and how strong it is, and then utilizing these tactics to get a better end result. So the last lien resolution issue I'm going to touch upon are FIBA and military liens and just going to hit this briefly. But really, uh, when it comes to FIBA, we're talking about the Neville's case. And when it comes to military, we're dealing with the FAMICRA. So FIBA is the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. The, the seminal case is Coventry Healthcare uh, of Missouri versus Neville's. Basically, um, in that case, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the FIBA preempts state law and that such preemption is constitutionally permissible. 
it makes fibulins very similar to ERISA plans uh, in that they have very powerful recovery rights. Doesn't mean you can't reduce a fibulin, but they are in a very uh, strong position to negotiate. In terms of military liens, there's three types of military coverage. There's VA, CHAMP VA, and TRICARE. Uh, VA covers current service, and CHAMP VA and TRICARE covers all the rest. All of these are governed by the Federal Medicare Recovery Act, which gives the government the right to recover for medical expenses incurred for medical care of an injured beneficiary when there's a liable third party. The biggest issue with military liens are uh, the military branches requiring protection agreements, which basically uh, obligates you to charging no fee uh, or costs against the government's portion of recovery in quotes. Um, also, another issue are, are the reach to first party benefits, whether uh, the government can recover under uh, the Federal Medical Care Recovery Act and that seminal cases and JAR, which you should review. Uh, but these issues are, are ones that you should be familiar with and this gives you a starting point for those lien resolution situations. So now on to the last topic, creating some time and space. Because of all these issues I've talked about, uh, in a lot of instances, it really makes some sense to create what's called a qualified settlement fund or QSF because it gives you breathing room and allows you to settle a case quickly while dealing with the multitude of issues that I've described throughout this presentation. And I'll explain that more in a moment. So as I said, this, this issue of a time crunch and you know, the critical uh, issues that need to be addressed. One of them is this idea of constructive receipt. And early on, I mentioned this in the malpractice uh, portion of the presentation, talking about triggering it can cause a real problem uh, for your client and a loss of opportunities to avail themselves of some planning mechanisms. So basically, constructive receipt means that, you know, once a taxpayer has a constructive receipt, that basically it's like actual receipts. So meaning if the money is in your trust account and the client could simply ask you to cut them a check, constructive receipt has been triggered. At that point, uh, there's no possibility to enter into a structured settlement, which is typically a cornerstone of, of many plans for catastrophically injured clients. And it can, in theory, uh, arguably trigger a loss of public benefits. So there's really only two ways to avoid constructive receipt. Either the defendant holds on to the funds or you create a qualified settlement fund, which is what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about momentarily. So a qualified settlement fund or QSF for short is a trust that's created pursuant to treasury regulations. It's a holding tank that allows for a cash settlement with the defendant, but not triggering constructive receipt. It can be done and frequently done um, in single point of cases, but it's widely used in mass tort settlements where uh, the defendant wants to simply make one settlement payment instead of making multiple settlement payments. And the reason it's done in, the QSF, uh, in a QSF is because the defendant can just pay the money in and meanwhile the monies can sit in that QSF and planning can be done. So if liens need to be dealt with or public benefit planning needs to be done or there's a structured settlement or a special needs trust or a Medicare set aside, all of those things can be done out of the QSF all the while avoiding constructive receipt. The primary drawback is that it requires court approval to create it and there's some additional expenses. Those drawbacks are typically significantly outweighed uh, by the benefits of creating one of these and how it helps deal with the time crunch. So setting up a, a QSF is quite easy. Um, basically, a, the court uh, who has jurisdiction over the matter can be petitioned or even a court that doesn't have jurisdiction and you get an order creating the QSF. The settlement between the plaintiff and defendant is a typical cash type of settlement, no special language in the release. Other than that, the consideration is uh, a payment of the settlement monies to the QSF and the check is made payable to the QSF instead of to your trust account. So 
when the QSF is established by court order, the monies that are deposited into them uh, remain in there without violating constructive receipt until allocation decisions can be made, lien satisfied, trusts or Medicare set-asides created, and structured settlement plan designs are decided upon. And then ultimately the QSF will terminate when all funds have been dispersed. QSFs are great for cases where you've got multiple claimants and there are allocation issues between the different claimants. Also, if there's multiple layers of coverage and you want to aggregate settlement monies, that's a great uh, reason to utilize this. If there are lien resolution issues, public benefit planning issues, structured settlements, whether it's the injury victim or the attorney wants to do tax deferral, or all of the above. And, and oftentimes these work best when they're really complicated cases with all these types of issues implicated. So I've covered a lot of issues. The final topic is structured settlements. You know, structured settlements are complicated transactions and they do present some malpractice traps for a personal injury attorney. And you wanna make sure ultimately that you're dealing with experts that understand these issues and can help navigate it. Using the QSF, it gives you time to really go through and investigate all these issues. Obviously, the, the biggest issue is not triggering constructive receipt if a structured settlement is, is contemplated. Um, you know, if there are um, large monies involved, trying to figure out ways to reduce any default risk, which is a low risk, but you know, spreading the premium amongst multiple different companies, so like Berkshire Life, New York Half, New York Life, uh, Pacific Life, you could put money with three different companies. There's also different ways that structured settlements can be done. There's secured creditor status. So there's things that can be done in terms of the way the structured settlements are constructed to reduce default risk. You wanna analyze the life company ratings or have an expert that's doing that. Also, rated ages are an issue that are um, is misunderstood, the impact of rated ages and understanding that when you combine it with annuity rates and looking at the arbitrage with different companies and how to leverage that is super important. And then lastly, commutation riders, which really comes into play oftentimes when you're dealing with situations like where a structured settlement's funding a special needs trust and you wanna make sure there's enough liquidity to pay back Medicaid for their uh, payback provision at death. But commutation just simply allows the structured settlement to be paid out in a lump sum instead of continuing future periodic payments. Covered a lot of different topics today and they're complicated issues and issues that uh, our team here at Synergy deals with on a daily basis. Uh, this picture is a picture from our last annual conference and I'm really incredibly proud of the team that we've assembled who is dedicated to working uh, tirelessly for injury victims, whether it's reducing liens, trying to address Medicare compliance, protecting government benefits, doing the settlement planning, Everyone here is dedicated to the mission of improving people's lives and helping the injury victim transition from litigation to life. Such an important thing that you all do in representing injury victims and what we do every day to help protect them once you've worked so hard and fought to recover uh, for their injuries. So I wanted to give you uh, just a little glimpse into the team that we've got that works incredibly hard for your clients. And that's our sole goal is to make sure that we've done the best we possibly can to protect you and your client and settle your case compliantly. That's me. If you have any questions about today's presentation or would like a free consultation, feel free to email me or call me. Thank you again for attending this month's third Thursday webinar. If you wanna learn more about how Synergy can help your law firm and your practice, go to synergysettlements.com.